We welcome everybody again. Um, we are going to have a brief introduction to the work of CAFE and then our wonderful speaker. So I'll try to keep this brief and, and get us going. Um, it's great to see you all here. I'm Victoria Van Heining. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Maryland's College of Information Studies, also known as the iSchool. Along with many of the folks on the call here today, I'm a founding member of the Center for Archival Futures, which we call CAFE for short. This is a relatively new iSchool Center, which started up in January of this year. We're a group of interdisciplinary researchers from the iSchool and beyond, whose work intersects the archives and digital curation very broadly conceived. We're interested in the systems, processes, and institutions that care for and enable the use of digital objects and data over time. The various projects that fall under CAFE's umbrella take a wide range of human-centered approaches to understanding topics, including data in communities, knowledge ecosystems, and the life cycles of data. Um, the speaker series uh, is our flagship event and is normally held on the first Wednesdays of each month during the semester. We host speakers who are at the cutting edge of archives and digital curation research and practice in a wide variety of institutions and roles. You can find recordings of our previous illustrious guest speakers on the CAFE event page, a link for which should be pasted into the chat. And if somebody could repaste that for anybody who's just come in, that would be great. Um, and it's now my pleasure to welcome our final speaker of the year um, for our uh, sort of guest external speakers. And we also have one more internal speaker next week. Um, Professor Matt Kirschenbaum is going to be talking about his new book. Um, and we will uh, just post a little more information about that in the chat towards the end of our time today. Um, anyhow, Professor Lorna Hughes is a professor of digital humanities at the University of Glasgow, where she's based in the information studies subject area. Her research addresses the creation of digital cultural heritage and the use and reuse of digital collections for research, teaching, and public engagement. She has a specific interest in the conceptualization, development, implementation, and categorization of digital methods in the humanities and the collaborations between the humanities and scientific disciplines that drive this agenda. Lorna has worked in digital humanities and on the development of hybrid digital collections based on material culture held by various memory institutions uh, in the US and the UK. Um, she's had leading roles as primary investigator or co-investigator on over 20 funded research projects, including the Welsh experience of the First World War, um, the Scottish National Heritage Partnership, um, and the EU uh, Daisier project, I think I'm saying that right, um, which is Daria Digital Sustainability work. Um, she's also the chair of the Europeana research advisory group and a member of the governing board and vice chair of Euroscience. She was the chair of the European Science Foundation, ESF, Network for Digital Methods in the Arts and Humanities. Um, among her publications, she's the author of Digitizing Collections, Strategic Issues for the Information Manager, and editor of Digital Collections, Use, Value, and Impact. She's the co-editor of the Virtual Representation of the Past, cultural heritage infrastructures and digital humanities. And her digital outputs include, and I've um, gotten a little Welsh language tutorial on this, so bear with me. Um, Revel bi de mil nau in pedwar i mil nau in with ar profiad comreg, the Welsh experience of the First World War from 1914 to 1918. And apologies to all of the people of Wales for that. <laughs> Um, and Lorna, now over to you. Um, please uh, feel free to share your screen. Um, folks who are in the audience, again, welcome. Um, as we go along, please uh, pop any questions you may have into the chat, but we'll hold the questions until the end. Um, but if you're having any techn technical difficulties, of course, put that in the chat as well, and we will try to help you out. Um, over to you, Lorna, thanks so much. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Victoria. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, I, right. I did remember to unmute myself before I um, shared my screen because that, that sometimes confuses me. Uh, thank you for the lovely introduction. It's um, a real pleasure 
to be here and to talk to you. I just wish I could be there in person. Um, just a couple of housekeeping and um, sort of uh, uh, global awareness issues. It is nine o'clock here. So um, there is a, a slight risk that my children may rush into the room and demand um, whatever it is they need at this time of night. Um, I apologize in advance if that happens. They have been warned severely. Um, um, but who knows what might happen. Um, so anyway, it's lovely to be, to be with you. I'm going to talk about um, a number of things tonight. I'm going to talk about some um, old research and some new research and some very, very late breaking research. And I'm going to talk about um, a brand new project that has just got started. Um, but I'm going to um, begin um, by talking about some research that I've done into community generated uh, content, uh, drawing on a number of um, research projects that I've been involved in really over the last 10 years. Um, my area of interest, as Victoria said, is the sort of creation and use of digital cultural heritage for a number of purposes. Um, understanding the complexity of the creation of digital heritage, understanding the stakeholders who are involved in um, the creation management and use of digital heritage, and understanding ways that it can become embedded in research and teaching. I'm very interested in the, the question of what do people do with all this digital stuff? Um, so I take a very reflective um, kind of perspective Perspective on digitization in heritage generally. Um, my background is originally in history, um, so I have focused uh, most recently on um, digital collections that are historic, um, that come from archives, that come from memory organizations, and um, Due to um, something that actually looks like a great big plan and um, carefully designed research um, program over 10 years, a lot of my projects have had to do with the First World War. Um, this is entirely by coincidence. Um, I started out as a medieval historian and uh, then got into digital humanities and um, was very fortunate to be based in the National Library of Wales running a research centre there while I was the University of Wales Chair in Digital Collections at the time of the centenary of the First World War, where there was a lot of interest in the use of digital approaches and methods for the, um, for the centenary. There was a lot of community interest and there was a lot of work going on in memory organizations to digitize collections. So um, I gleefully jumped on the bandwagon of um, digitizing First World War collections and um, developed five projects and um, I'm not going to go through the projects in detail, but um, I am talk the research I'm talking about this evening is a synthesis of these five projects and um, has come together uh, through um, a conglomeration of, uh, of research activities funded by JISC, by the European Commission and the Arts and Humanities Research Council in the UK. So, I am going to, uh, so as I said, I'm going to refer to a number of different projects, but they all relate to the, um, to the, the, the centenary of the First World War. Um, the centenary was a very, very interesting period for those of us who are actively engaged in digital heritage. Um, I've referred to it as um, a digital big bang. It was the first sort of major public facing centenary commemoration event that was truly embedded in the digital age. And as a consequence, um, a large number of funders, uh, government organizations, uh, public sector organizations and memory institutions all began to, uh, to digitize collections and to develop public facing um, digital projects. Um, 
the digital was a, a real disruption um, during this period. And uh, there was a, a, a real embracing of technology. And what we saw come out of that uh, was a significant number of digital outputs, um, a large number of databases, data sets, digital archives, um, and a lot of work that was developed by communities and small heritage organizations, community archives, local history societies. Um, I have calculated probably inexactly, but I have calculated that we now have greater coverage of that period from roughly 1914 to 1919 in digital form than any other historic period. So it's really a rather unusual thing to look at, it's a rather unusual historical period in terms of its digital coverage. Um, so there's quite a lot of lessons to be learned from what happened during that period and how it's been represented digitally, um, which I think offers a template and also a bit of a warning, as you'll hear, um, about uh, future commemoration, commemorations and future large scale digital initiatives that are very public facing. In the UK, a lot of this work was funded by an organisation called the Heritage Lottery Fund. Um, we have a lottery in the United Kingdom and it uses its ill-gotten profits for, uh, for good causes. Um, one of those good causes is heritage um, and um, it disperses funding to community organizations and memory institutions. And much of it was used during the commemoration to develop First World War projects um, that were developed by communities that resulted in websites and archives and resources. The one thing that we saw a huge amount of during this period was a really extensive use of crowdsourcing and the creation of community generated digital content. Um, now, I know that uh, Victoria is an expert on crowdsourcing and citizen science. Um, community generated digital content is a kind of subsection of, um, um, of crowdsourcing of citizen science. Um, and it is very specifically uh, defined, I define it as digitized historical materials uh, from personal collections um, that have been collected through community digitization engagement and initiatives and activities, and especially through open workshops. Um, it's basically the stuff people have in their homes, stuff that they have in their personal collections um, that they have digitized in order to make accessible. It may be then held by or donated to a community archive, a community heritage organization. But the key thing is that we are not talking about official records. We're talking about personal collections which augment the official narrative um, and which tell stories that are otherwise hidden or unseen. Um, it is very dispersed and there have been a couple of projects that have experimented with gathering this material. Um, the earliest uh, community generated digital content um, projects, I think, I think, as far as I can tell, the very first one started at Oxford um, in the Oxford Digital Humanities Centre, where they had a project um, called the um, First World War Poetry Archive, which turned into the Great War Archive, uh, developed by Stuart Lee and colleagues. This was a model that actually began that um, going around and inviting people to bring along personal materials that related to the First World War. Um, so I'll mention again a few other projects that look at it, but the theoretical framework for my research was um, trying to understand um, the life cycle um, of community generated digital content, um, how it had how it had been collected, how it had been curated, how it was exposed, um, its role in international centenary initiatives, um, and 
from that, trying to understand its value and impact and whether or not it could be used or reused for, um, for research or teaching or public engagement. Um, so I had a look at the, the entire heritage life cycle of community generated content in order to understand how it was used, how it was reused, um, fusing uh, digital humanities theory and community archives theory. Um, my aim was to try and develop a critical framework for community generated digital content um, through an analysis of this life cycle in order to really understand um, where the issues were with this material. Now, I mentioned a critical framework for digital heritage. This is, this is a core aspect of my own research in um, both digital collections and digital humanities. Um, I wrote a book in 2003 that included a framework for digitizing collections, um, which I've ca uh, categorized as um, selection and capture, metadata, interface, metadata and description, interface, access, functionality, sustainability, use and reuse. So you can see if you're familiar with digital collections that this is a, a very simple, simplified version of a digital life cycle. Um, there are interventions at every stage of this life cycle that affect the um, use and reuse of the of digital collections. This life life cycle is essential for digital preservation, for digital curation. It's a, a really foundational life cycle within digital collections. Um, I did a little bit of work recently um, refining this uh, through some practice-led research, creating my own digital collections uh, within a critical heritage content, kind of bringing it up to date. But essentially, this is a very canonical model um, of, the, of the digital life cycle. It's, it, it, it really is very, very straightforward. Um, so what is in scope as community generated content? So um, I received funding from JISC in 2011 uh, to develop a large scale digital archive of the First World War. This was um, digitizing material from the archives and special collections of all the, organ all the um, libraries and university archives across Wales. Um, but I wanted to um, adopt the Oxford model of doing some community workshops, uh, going around the country, um, inviting people to come along and bring their personal collections, uh, which were digitized and amplified the, uh, the official narratives. So the materials that we were digitizing from the, from the main archive collections included things like newspapers, um, the Welsh Army Corps records, that sort of thing, but, but very kind of official materials. So um, we went out to the community and asked them to come and bring their personal collections. Um, and we got some really interesting stuff. This is uh, Maria Pint Phillips. She was the first woman to graduate as a doctor from Cardiff University. Uh, she ran field hospitals in the major theatres of war from 1914 to 1917. And one of her relatives just rocked up at this workshop with all her papers, which we digitized and put in our archive. Um, these are really interesting because they're a very good example of that amplification of the official narrative. Um, they, they really tell the story of how field hospitals were put together very pragmatically, very much on the fly. Um, her archive is full of telegrams saying, stop what you're doing in France and go to Serbia at once. Um, we don't have anything. We don't know what we're doing, but by the time you get there, it'll all be sorted. So there's some really interesting materials there. Um, you know, have you got a passport? I, are you ready? Can you go now? Um, so it, it, it's really an interesting story. It's it's something that is in somebody's personal collection that really um, sort of uh, tells us more. Um, 
This was all done on a much larger scale um, by Europeana uh, using their project, uh, Europeana 1418, uh, which, which took uh, the, the Oxford model that I had adapted um, and, and went global <laughs> with it. And they ran workshops all over Europe and they generated about 250,000 items of community generated digital content, which was all very interesting. They went around all the, uh, all the countries of Europe, they did um, workshops in many interesting places. Um, and they got some amazing stuff. They got some beautiful photographs. They got some artifacts and they were all digitized in situ. It is a very fragmented archive though. It's 250,000 very disparate items because of the nature of the items. They, they are personal, they're quite uh, disparate. And the evaluation of Europeana 14 very much focused on the, the value of the experience of being involved in a community digitization initiative. Um, and the, the emphasis was really, you know, the value of, of being part of a participatory heritage exercise, being involved in something where people felt they were challenging that authoritative, the authoritative heritage discourse, the authoritative voice in heritage. Um, the, the experience people had of understanding their own history, their community history, and the also, also the value that people felt from reappraising material in their collections. This was something that they thought was important, but then an expert came along and told them it was even more important. It's really the antiques roadshow model of history. Um, but it was very interesting. The, the things that came out of the European Europeana evaluation were really valuable, really interesting, but also really terrifying because people were saying things like, well, I'm so glad this has been digitized because now it'll last forever and I'm so glad it's now on the web because um, now it will be protected for future generations and those of us who are involved in digital preservation know that actually that there's there's quite a lot of dependencies in there and especially something that has come out of communities in this way so I kind of thought well I'd like to I, th I think there's a challenge here. I think there is an issue in the fragility of community generated digital content. So I wanted to do some more research into the, the, the legacy of this material to understand how it could be used and reused over the longer term. And one of the, one of the challenges with this kind of material um, is that there had actually been very little thought given to how community generated digital content would be used or reused after the data had been collected. Um, lots of these projects, while they were wonderful, they had brought communities together, they didn't intend any kind of reuse of this material as the end goal. They, they certainly didn't intend research reuse of this material. Um, the, the, the whole point of the exercise was getting people together to come and digitize things and, and talk about, you know, aren't we all a bit the same as each other and isn't that nice and look at all our lovely things on a website. We ended up with a very, very heterogeneous archive of data that was that was very siloized. The other thing I found that community generated digital content is actually very poorly theorized. It falls into a gap, a real sweet spot, I think, um, between research and community archives of the sort done by Andy Flynn and the kind of research that Sharon Webb at Sussex has done on digital community archives by which she means things like Usenet and um, digital, uh, sort of digital discussion groups, chat boards, that kind of thing. Community generated digital content is neither of these things and it, 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 it is very poorly theorized. Um, community archives are notoriously fragile, by which I mean analog archives that communities have brought together. And it seems to me that we have very much replicated the fragility of community archives only in a digital format. 
Um, and there is a real parallel with community archives because quite often there are questions about ownership and curation and management of the material. And essentially um, community generated digital content is often orphaned content. It raises really quite serious questions about how it is managed, who has custody of it and how it's uh, how it is cared for over the longer term. And this fragile sustainability of community generated content, I think, makes it much less valuable to people who want to work with it over the longer term. Um, and, and that, you know, compromises the value of its creation, which, which is problematic because there has been a huge investment in this material. So I did, I did a study, I did some interviews with um, a bunch of projects that had created community generated digital content, including the Great War Archive at Oxford, Europeana, um, and a few other projects that had, had done this in order to kind of understand a little bit about how the material had been curated, how it had been collected, the effectiveness of these roadshows, um, the sustainability data management guidelines that were followed, whether or not the material was used uh, usable over the longer term um, and how it could be integrated into historical narratives and historical research. How useful was it for, um, for historical reusing? Um, and I found that it was not a very happy story um, and that a great deal of community generated content, including Europeana itself, because uh, Europeana doesn't actually collect material, the, the 1418 project was an anomaly. A great deal of this material is incredibly fragile. And in fact, I think it is born fragile and it's born fragile because every stage in the community generated content life cycle actually is antithetical to the digital life cycle to good practice within the digital life cycle so in our digital life cycle model that i mentioned earlier you know content is selected and then it is digitized using um, you know the good practice of a particular organization for community generated content there's no selection it's entirely dependent on what members of the public bring along um, its creation is in situ um, so capture you know they usually use a scanner or a high resolution high quality digital camera but there isn't that attention to detail of calibration that kind of thing that you would get in a in a formal digitization setting the description is often incredibly limited the description happens in situ what these projects all report is that you have one opportunity to gather information about the material from people it's incomplete often um, issues are neglected around rights descriptions ownership copyright again this all inhibits the use and reuse of the material um, the interface and access to the material quite often is just put on a website, which um, has been put together quickly. In the case of the Heritage Lottery funded projects, um, most of these projects had a budget of about £5,000, so they didn't have an awful lot of money for IT or equipment. They put things on a blog, on a Tumblr, um, which couldn't be harvested by the web archive. So there were all kinds of challenges around access and and. Uh, digital interface. Um, Long-term digital access was very infrequently factored into the development and it, the content was fragmented and siloized, siloized on locally managed websites. So overall, from a digital curation perspective, from a digital sustainability perspective, community generated digital content is incredibly fragile. Um, it's an endangered digital species. If it was an animal, it'd be a baby panda. Um, and it's been um, in this this approach has been endorsed by the Digital Preservation Coalition, who um, categorize uh, community generated digital content as critically endangered. Um, and at great, great risk of loss. Um, so, sorry, I skipped ahead there. So, um, yeah, so here are the challenges. Um, so the conclusion of this sort of analysis of the, the, the problem and, and what had been done and what, what needs to be done, um, 
my first conclusion was that um, we really need to engage with post-custodial approaches to managing community-generated content. This, this model of the community digital, coming along, digitizing the material and then disappearing um, just doesn't work. Um, post-custodial approaches where the communities that hold materials and own materials and have the expertise and knowledge to describe and um, share that material continue to have involvement in the uh, in the management and oversight of that material, even though it might be hosted by an archival organization. This is an emerging model that has come out of a lot of um, indigenous archives and digitization of um, community collections. Um, it was developed, the post custodial mo model was developed um, in the 1950s by Gerald Ham, but it's it's emerging and being refined uh, to fit a digital era and for community generated content that we can really see that that ongoing engagement with the communities that understand this material are absolutely essential. Um, again this this ontology of community generated content is really necessary understanding its dependencies understanding how it relates to other materials um, and to understand the how the life cycle of creation of um, community generated content affects its longevity is really essential. Um, and again, very pragmatically, um, I wrote a report uh, for one of my projects about the fragility of community generated uh, digital content um, that had come out of the First World War commemoration. And um, I think any future commemorations really need to engage with this at the start because community generated content is going to be part of any kind of future um, anniversaries commemorations we have um, supposedly a, 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 a another jubilee in the UK next year um, so that's that's going to be another another the, the questionable commemoration in terms of the digital legacy and I think understanding this culture of digitization this this idea that we we're very good at digitizing culture we're really good at building digitization programs whether they're formal or informal in major heritage organizations or in community archives but we really don't understand the culture of digitization and how it's participatory and how it involves communities and um, we can use all the technology we want but if we don't have a link to the communities that understand that material and we can bring them in using post custodial models it's not going to work so i'm now going to talk about something that might solve these problems um, but you'll have to come back again in three years when i finish this new project because um, this research um, that i had done uh, that i've described was the basis of a, a new project i've just had funded by the arts and humanities research council in the uk um, through its uh, Towards a National Collection program, which has funded five discovery projects across the UK, um, which aim to transform online exploration of the UK's culture and heritage collections using AI. Um, this call came out in um, this call came out in i'm sorry i'm just trying to remember exactly when it came out because the pandemic got in the way um it came out in um early 2020 i, I don't know about anyone else i have trouble with years since the last 18 months i can't actually remember when anything happened but i think it was march 2020 and i immediately said well there is uh, community generated digital content is um, is fragmented, it's fragile, it's difficult to link, it's difficult to share, AI has a role to play in this. I'm going to I'm going to write a proposal. So I spent lockdown writing this proposal, which was hilarious uh, because I did all the development work with all the partners working on the project um, via Zoom. Um, some of them I've still not met. Um, but we worked with a team at the National Archives in the UK and the University of Manchester Computing Science and also the John Rylands History Institute. Um, and we said, right, let's 
build a consortium of uh, libraries and heritage organizations around the country um, that have community generated content or who have connections with communities that have uh, built um, archives that, that come from the public. And uh, let's work on two things. Let's work on using technologies to link and share and federate this material uh, based on a better understanding of the ontology of this material and the ecosystems that underpin its development. And then let's build a um, participatory post-custodial model for managing this material that, that brings those communities into the discussion and the debate and subverts the archival process in a way that, uh, that makes it much more participatory over the long term. So amazingly, I got funded. Um, which I was extremely happy about. And we've now started to work on the project. You can see by the little dots that um, our partners are all over the United Kingdom. Um, we have um, the Tate, the British Museum, the National Archives, the National Library of Wales, National Library of Scotland, Public Records Office of Northern Ireland, Archives Plus in Manchester, um, and the Dictionaries of the Scots Language to help us understand multilingual issues. Um, mm. And it's, it's a very, very uh, geographically diverse project. Um, at the core, the, our structure is to carry out um, lab research to understand better the, the ecosystem and the digital life cycle of community generated content, uh, to use AI technologies to, um, to link and share that content, to build an observatory for remixing and reusing that content, and to have a history lab um, that will enable us to tell um, new histories and new narratives. So we try and, break and, and resolve all of the problems that I've explained in the first part of my talk based on the, uh, the, the, the earlier work, um, especially the embedding of this material into the historical narrative and, and really using it to, uh, to, to tell new histories. Um, so this is this is the model um, that we will we will be building. Um, this is this is our ecosystem. Um, so you see, we are bringing in community generated content from the National Archives. That's the big container of material that the National Archives has already taken in. That's come from communities through their discovery service. Uh, we will use that to get to grips with the metadata and description of community generated content, uh, working on understanding the complexity of the way it's described, the way it's managed, um, the content that's in it. We use this to generate knowledge graphs, which will uh, reflect the semantic structure of community generated content to train AI models to discover further community generated content in the wild. Um, and uh, bring it into the TNA's Manage My Collection system. Um, the little human figures, not human figures, little stick figures there are um, people because we have a, a large component of our project is actually human, um, which is working with communities to continue to refine the metadata and description of collections at the same time as the AI is learning how to understand it. Um, and to work with communities and all our heritage partners to really build and share those post-custodial models. And um, the public facing part of the project will be our digital content observatory for remixing and reusing. Um, I'm not going to go through this in a great deal of detail because um, the project has just started, um, but just a few aspects that may be of interesting from uh, information studies, information management perspective. As I said, the, the, the real key here is understanding the ecosystem of community content in order to really understand that life cycle and to understand how things are described and managed. 
we have a very large uh, nat natural language processing and corpus linguistic work that will enable us to work with um, multi-dialectical and multilingual material um, in because a large part of the challenge is working with non-standard English materials. Um, and ultimately what we want to do is understand how communities describe their content, not how archivists describe that content, because that's really essential to um, to actually encode that hybridity and nuance into the materials. The AI aspects are very classic canonical AI approaches. We're not doing anything new or exciting with AI, but what we are doing is applying uh, canonical AI methods for text mining and um, build and semantic uh, semantic linking to um, a very very difficult and gritty collection. I always say that in the humanities um, we work with data at scale, but it's not the size of the data; it's the complexity. Um, so the community generated content will really give the the AI approaches a, a run for their money. Um, and hopefully enable predictive um, understanding of this material over the long time. But the bit that I think will be the, the, the true lasting legacy of the project, I mean, obviously we will develop technological models and approaches that ultimately will link content and make it accessible for mixing. But speaking as somebody who works in an information studies department, I think that the the, the longest lasting legacy of this project will be that we'll be building a toolkit for post custodial approaches for community generated digital content, which through the information studies department at Glasgow will be embedded into archival training. Um, so I think that that um, for me building a uh, um, a model that is replicable, um, as I've said here, semantics aware, fair, compliant and sustainable post-custodial model uh, for use across the sector, working with experts in community heritage across the country and working with them to make that model replicable. So if you're working in a community generated archive on the island of Lewis, or you're working at the National Archives in London, um, you have equitable access to understanding this new model and how it can make your material um, usable and sustainable over the longer term. So as I said, we've really only started. Um, it's quite a big project. Um, there's a lot to do. Um, please do follow us on Twitter, follow our website, and uh, we will be running workshops. As it looks like lockdown is gonna continue for quite some time, these workshops will be online. So there'll be opportunities to take part and come along and find out what we're doing. Um, so, Thank you for your attention. It's been um, really nice to, to tell you a little bit about uh, what we're doing, the new pro project, and to also just try and understand a little bit more about the, uh, the, the, the challenges that we're trying to address with the new project. So um, thank you. And I will stop sharing. Thank you, Lorna. That is great. I'll put us into gallery, perhaps, I don't know, maybe not. Uh, I'm assuming actually everybody, Lorna, is still spotlighted for you all. Is that correct? Okay, cool. So um, thank you so much for that. That is hugely, hugely resonant um, for many of us here uh, at the University of Maryland. And it's just a delight to think about all the major um, institutional players and individuals and communities that you're bringing together on this work in the UK. Um, I think let's start with the questions that are in the chat. I think one of them you've answered um, along the way, but if you wanna add any more detail, um, I'll read the first one out uh, from Tiffany, uh, unless Tiffany, you would prefer to unmute and ask your question. Hi. Hi. Go for it. Okay, so I was more curious about the the logistics. Like you said, you go out into the community and you get all of this information. How are you actually gathering the photos, the papers? Like what what are the logistics in doing that? Are you doing like a community day? 
There's different models. Um, so for my project for Cymru 1914, we actually ran workshops, which were, I know it's hard to imagine, but there was a time when you could, you could go somewhere and people came to you and you were all in the same room together. <laughs> Sorry, I'm being a bit facetious, but um, we actually ran um, community workshops at archives around the country. And we would show up, um, advertise the event ahead of time. People would come along, bring the material with them. And we would, um, we would have a scanner. Um, we had some digital cameras. We had a metadata form, which they filled out. Um, and we um, uploaded the material to our server remotely, um, and we also saved it to uh, to um, laptops that we brought with us. So it was it was like a a van. It was like a digital roadshow. <laughs> Um, other projects did things differently. Um, the Oxford Great War Archive also had a feature where people could upload their own materials. Um, so people could take a photograph and um, submit things to the archives. Um, I think that's slightly less successful because um, it's harder to engage people. You have to continually ask them for information and that kind of thing, but, but that is a, an option. Europeana did a bit of both, uh, but they mostly did the workshop model where they actually physically went to, uh, got people to come along and, and gather material. But it is a really interesting question because it does make me realize that um, over the last 18 months, this sort of activity uh, will have been extremely limited um, and people will have had to adopt remote models for any kind of um, community content generation. So uh, that's that's an interesting thing. Thank you. Thank you. I, I have one follow up question quickly, not to Bogart. Um, now you said this is the workshop model. Any uh, recommended reading for this model? Um, that is, again, a very good question. Um, <laughs> it's, it's been documented, but very informally as uh, this was one of the things that I that I found when I embarked on this research is that and and this is very much my bad because I was supposed to write several articles during lockdown about this model and about the post custodial model and about the theoretical framework but instead I wrote a big grant application because that that seemed more achievable during conditions of lockdown um, but uh, it is very interesting and, and, and this is an incredibly valid question because it is very poorly documented. People have written about crowdsourcing and I, I wrote a chapter for a book about crowdsourcing where I talked about what we did, you know, what we did in Wales. Um, it's in, oh, Victoria has a copy right there. That's great. Uh, I so paid her to do that. Um, but uh, yeah, we uh, we wrote a chapter in, in that book um, where we described what we had done, um, but it really was remarkable how few people have actually really got to grips with this in a in a sort of theoretical way. Would you agree, Victoria? I mean, you're much more of an expert on crowdsourcing than I am. And people write about crowdsourcing, you know, they write about the sort of theory and practice of, you know, the, the galaxy zoo kind of approach, but the, but the community generated content approach, I find um, very few people had really got to grips with it. So, um, I really need to write some articles now that my grant's funded. Yes, you do. I, I'm actually assisting with planning uh, a community event. Hopefully, we're shooting for next spring. So that's why I asked. <laughs> well, have a look at the chapter in that book that Victoria was waving around because they, we do talk about what we did there, but but most of it's grey literature. Am I right, Victoria? There's, there's, there's not that much, is there? Um, I think that that is true, particularly for um, this, you know, come and bring us your content. I think it's written about less than other crowdsourcing approaches. That said, I'm thinking of a couple of things that might be of kind of parallel um, utility. So the folks who run the Citizen Scanning Center at the National Archives over here um, might have some 
techniques that although they're doing all their work in a dedicated space at NARA, there may be some kind of analogous um, planning and, and suggestions that they have. Um, other possibilities are looking at um, transcribe-a-thon and Wikipedia edit-a-thon type of models. So things like um, the Douglas Day group um, who, who celebrate on Frederick Douglass's birthday on February 14th um, every year might be valuable. And there's also, um, and I'll see if I can pull up a link for it, but a federal uh, agency toolkit for crowdsourcing and a number of colleagues at the Library of Congress, including Megan Ferreter, um, contributed to that. And I think there's sort of ongoing um, contribution to that. And again, that's me a little bit more on the citizen science model, but I think that there might be um, some helpful uh, parallels there. And Katrina, I wonder if your work um, has, has thrown up any of these examples as well. Yeah, I was just thinking about like the <clears throat> archivist in a backpack model. Um, I'll try to find a couple links and throw them into the chat. Yes, I will love that. Thank you, guys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, the, the People's Collection Wales had a couple, have some stuff on their website as well. So I, I think, you know, there are web resources. The handbook I'd forgotten about, but I think that was mostly crowdsourcing. Pip Wilcox, who's one of our project partners, wrote a chapter for that. Um, based on their engaging crowds project, but again, it was it was very much um, you know sort of uh, community metadata, uh, community cataloging that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, have a look at the um, the People's Collection Wales website. They've got a really handy metadata sheet. Um, that they get people to fill out at their workshops, which which is the one that we used, and that was very valuable. Um, but it it does tend to be sort of this kind of grey literature, you know, this kind of handbooks, documentation, you know, sort of guidelines, that sort of thing, rather than a sort of really really rigorously peer reviewed tome that, that yeah, goes yeah. into all the details. Um, Kylie, we've got your question next and it looks as though we've sort of touched on this but do you want to um, unmute and ask this or a related question yeah sure i apologize for my premature question because you definitely <laughs> went over this um, in detail um, but i found myself thinking about like just the magnitude of going to all the different countries and putting together these kinds of projects um, and thinking about um, like the ac actual like physical technical equipment that is required to to take in these materials through like digitization and whatnot. Um, so I said, um, what kind of technical infrastructure did um, these types of community archives um, processing require and would you use like existing um, scanning equipment at various locations. Yeah, that's it, it's a really good question. I mean, the Europeana project was huge. I mean, it was funded by the Commission. They had a lot of resources, but most of the resources were put into organizing the workshops. The actual kit that they had um, was, you know, sort of almost backpackable, I guess. Um, the you know they had cameras, tripods um portable scanners that kind of thing um but the the mobilization of the workshops was really the expensive and labor intensive part and the advertising of the workshops and encouraging people to come and encouraging participation um the follow-on that they did with europeana that was very interesting was a transcribe-a-thon um, where they got people to come back and transcribe the materials um, and that that was very useful that was that used sort of classic citizen science approaches um, and again that was that was a sort of a runner workshop kind of model um, so it's it's not really it's, it's the classic problem with anything digital humanities it's not necessarily technologically intensive but it's 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 the human infrastructure it's it's the training it's the getting people in the right place at the right time 
uh, making sure people understand what they're doing and and documenting and replicating and and making sure that everything is consistent and that the metadata is checked and all that kind of thing is it's really a, 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 a human challenge which is one of the reasons why I mean it's it's very tricky because I think that some of the community work that was done through the first world war commemoration was really wonderful and really moving and really touching and and you know it really brought communities together um it it helped you know sort of build bridges and mend fences and had all sorts of lovely outputs and it was it was empowering for a lot of people and and it produced really nice things and I don't I, I, I don't want to come along as this sort of go, well, yes, it's not very sustainable, is it? You know, why did you even bother? Um, so it, it, it's striking that balance, but at the same time, I, but I think the point I was trying to make is that one of the reasons that so many First World War projects adopted this approach is that it was incredibly accessible. It was, it was uh, you know, the, the admission price was very low, for this kind of workshop. You don't have to buy really fancy scanning equipment. You don't need a big digital infrastructure. You just need a, you know, you just need a blog and a digital camera and you don't even need a digital camera and now you can use your phone. Um, so the the sort of the technical infrastructure is very, very low, the, the requirements, but the human requirements in order to do it right are actually quite high. And, and and that's problematic and that's that's why I think the sustainability has been very challenging. Yeah, thank you for answering my question. Thanks, Kyla. <laughs> and spending your evening. <laughs> Seconded. Um, Anna, I see that uh, you've got your hand up. Yeah, so on to uh, a, a sort of tangential thread to that and also to the um, issue you brought up before about scale in terms of complexity, <laughs> um, as well as sort of these issues of scale in general, um, we've been having a lot of discussions about um, movements in reparative description and just the ways that, you know, trying to ensure that content that's created is appropriate content and culturally sensitive content and, and, um, and all the rest. And so um, in your AI piece, I'm wondering about how you all are thinking about that or grappling with that. And I assume the community consultation and all the, the people in that diagram are part of the control on that kind of thing. But I'm wondering um, how, you're, how you're dealing with that um, and the sort of like potential risk of AI to reproduce problematic information. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that's one of the things, that's one of the fundamental issues in, in the project is that co curation co-production uh where it will be archivists working with that's why we had all the three wavy lines on my uh, on my diagram because the archivists will be working with the um the ai tech ai um computer scientists um who will be working with the historians who will be working with the you know the the language people and um it's it's a very very integrated project because otherwise it, it just will not work um and we're we're very cognizant of that and it's that was one of the initial um, conversations that was very interesting. And this is why I said, I think the post-custodial approach is going to be the lasting legacy because actually getting the, the sort of professional archivists that are part of the pro project um, to understand that there, there are points where the community expertise is the correct information and the archival structures and narratives and standards are actually incorrect is is going to be really interesting and it's it has been very interesting and I'm not going to name names and I'm not going to generalize and I'm not talking about the National Archives here I'm talking about other partners in the project we have found that that there is a huge disparity among official archives, official national library type organizations. Some of them are incredibly amenable to bringing in community content and have large, con uh, large collections that they have 
proactively sought from the community. They've said, oh, there's an environmental group here and we must capture their archive. We must work with them on documenting it and, you know, been very, very proactive. And there are other organizations within our partnership that are sort of, well, if it's not a business record, then we're not interested in it. And if it is not an officially sanctioned organization that is, a, you know, a recognized, um, you know, business or, you know, organization, then, then we cannot take it and we can, we will not have it. And it, it has been very interesting to me, even just within the, 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 the classic standard archival profession, how that how that has broken down a little bit. So um, yeah, so co-production, co-creation, and uh, you know, no privileging of particular voices uh, or the bywords. But yeah, but we will we will have a lot more to report on that as the project goes on. <laughs> Thank you so much. And thank you for your awesome talk. It's really great to hear about this project. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and that seems like a pretty good note at which to um, leave this part of the talk and thank Lorna um, with our emojis and uh, hands and whatever else. Um, I had promised that I was going to say more about our uh, next speaker. And so just bear with me as I try to pull up the relevant uh, item, which I fear I've closed. Um, so I will just say, uh, please circle back to our event webpage, um, which will update shortly. And I'll stick that in the chat once again. Um, we'll be hearing from uh, Matt Kirschenbaum, who heads up our digital humanities uh, certificate here at UMD and um, has uh, published, oh, is that the link to register, Luis? Yes. I think so. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so yes, if you are feeling the high from this talk, you can go immediately and register for the next. Um, we'll be meeting next Wednesday, um, December the 8th. And Matt will be telling us about his new book, which if I remember rightly, um, is actually dedicated to uh, uh, all his colleagues and students here at UMD. So. Um, how can you not come when the book is dedicated to you is the real question. Um, the, somebody's asking about the slides and um, video. Um, we definitely will be sharing out the video uh, in the coming weeks. Um, Lorna, how do you feel about slide sharing? Yeah, I'm happy for them to be shared. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, so we will maybe pop those up on the website as well. Um, Lorna, thank you again so much, particularly given the late hour. And so we will definitely uh, let you go, but um, thank you again and uh, we'll, we'll be in touch. Thank you for having me and enjoy the rest of your day. Okay, thanks. <laughs> See you again, bye-bye.